Today being the 1st of October, of course, is the beginning of a new month. And it was just yesterday, the last day in September, when I was flicking through this Bible. And at the very back, I noticed that the, at the end of chapter 22 of Revelation, on the next page, it says here, 30 days with Jesus, as you can see there, 30 days with Jesus. And there was a theme for each of the 30 days. And I thought, well, today being October, let's start with day one and go through to day 30. But of course, October has got 31 days. So what I have done there at the very bottom, I've added on a sticky note, day 31. So what I propose to do for October is day by day by day, going through the scriptures which have been given in the uh, with reference to the each of the each of the days of the 30 days and I've added another day so the first day here there are three scriptures and it says there's a theme Jesus coming is predicted so let's start and let's go through with the first one which is in Isaiah chapter 7 and the first two scriptures in fact all three scriptures today will be very well known to us of course here we are, Isaiah chapter 7. And the, it's just one verse which is referred to in, in the theme, the, the thematic in, index at the back of this Bible. can be dangerous, can be misleading to just read one verse. And of course, in any event, the original scriptures were not broken down into chapters or verses. They read as one narrative. I do have one Bible which has just chapter numbers. It doesn't have any headings. And of course, the headings, which we have at the beginning of chapters and which split chapters up sometimes, they're not scripture. But they give us an idea. They give us a clue, so to speak, as to what is going to be coming in the following verses. But they're not scripture. And they may not necessarily always be totally accurate. But I have one Bible, as I've said, which has chapter numbers, but no headings, and no verses. This Bible does have chapter numbers and verses, and it does have some headings. But anyway, let's get back to <clears throat> the text here in Isaiah, chapter 7. And I'm not going to give the historical context here or the background. I'm just going to read um, verses 10 through, well, maybe five verses. I haven't quite decided yet, but we'll see how we go. So Isaiah, chapter 7, beginning at verse 10. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to, to weary men? But will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he shall eat, so that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both kings. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you, and your people, and your father's house, days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. Just picking out one concept from there, which is that the, referring of course the child being the Lord Jesus, born, conceived and born of a virgin. His name would be called Emmanuel, which of course means God with us. And it said that he would know how to refuse evil and choose good. So we see there that in his humanity, the Lord Jesus was God and he was human. In his humanity, he knew the difference between good and uh, evil, between right and wrong, between righteousness and unrighteousness. And he would have the ability to refuse evil and to choose good. That's the Lord Jesus in his humanity. So in case anybody would say to any one of us, well, of course, the Lord Jesus was God and therefore he 
could not sin, it would be impossible for him to sin, that would be saying he was something like an automaton or, or, or some sort of robot. But no, that would not be the case because here we see that he would know how to refuse evil and if he could refuse evil he would know what evil was and he could choose what was good. And we know that he was tempted in all ways. The scripture tells us he was tempted in all ways as we as people are. Yet he did not sin. He knew the difference and he made a decision. He chose good as opposed to evil and wickedness and unrighteousness and sinning. He made that choice and that's the choice for us all to make of course today and every day. The second scripture referred to at the end of this uh, Bible is a little bit further on in Isaiah, just a couple of chapters later, chapter 9, beginning with, well, we'll read from verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 9. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the days of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will, will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. There's much in there. And I mentioned at the beginning that as we go through, from with reference to the end of the Bible, days 1 to 30, because there are 31 days in October, I have added a day 31 and it's on day 31 that we will look to the future we will look at the final two or three verses there from the passage which i have just read we'll be looking at at the end of october verses six and seven of isaiah nine but up to and including the very beginning of verse six of isaiah nine it talks about up for unto us a child is given unto us a son is given Reference to the Lord Jesus, reference to his, uh, his coming, the first time, the first advent of the Lord Jesus, his first coming. The final scripture referred to here for day one is in uh, Luke, the Gospel of Luke. And it tells me to read verses 26 through to 38. So that is what I shall do. Luke chapter 1 verses 26 to 38. Now in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary and having come in the angel said to her rejoice highly favoured one the Lord is with you blessed are you among women. But when she saw him she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? 
And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. What an experience for this young woman, Mary, who hadn't had relations with a man, to be confronted, to have this experience with an angelic being who should say to her that she is favoured because she would be the carrier, in human terms, of the, uh, of the Lord Jesus, who is given certain titles here in these verses that we read. I wonder how, if Mary took that in in one go. I doubt it indeed. I wonder if she went away and thought about these things, pondered, and oh, I wonder if she could get her mind round everything, as the, as the expression goes. But she was favoured because she would be the, the, the woman by whom, through whom, the saviour of the world would be produced. But of course, that was as far as it went, really. Uh, Mary referred to there at the end verse which I read, verse 38. Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord. She knew her position. She was not God. She never would be God. She carried the Son of God, she carried God, but she understood her position. And it's not for us to elevate Mary to the same level as God. She didn't do that. She acknowledged in another place in Scripture um, her... Um, well, it's a bit further down the page. I can just quickly refer to it in, in what's commonly called the Song of Mary. It's, uh, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour. So Mary recognised that she needed a Saviour, and that God, Almighty God, was her Saviour. So we don't turn to Mary as being our Saviour, our Deliverer, our Rescuer. We acknowledge who Mary was, and the important role very important role, the unique role that she played in the history of mankind by being favoured by Almighty God to be the one through whom the Messiah would come into the world. But that's as far as it goes with Mary, not meaning her any disrespect, but that's what scripture quite simply tells me. So that's a fairly quick look at those, fairly, those, those three scriptures which are referred to, as I've said, at the end here. I'm turning to it again quickly here. It says, Jesus' coming is predicted. Well, it was in Isaiah, and it was in other scriptures as well. But of course, here uh, in, we come to the Gospels, and if I had were to read further on in Luke, we would see the, the actual arrival of the Messiah. And looking here on day two, I can see that that's exactly what we're going to do. So I hope you'll be able to join me tomorrow, October the 2nd, when we look at the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ.